Hey, everybody, it's the Drive School Podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman, your host, and uh, my good friend, uh, Deaconess Sarah Longmire, is back with us. She is our Bible study editor. She is uh, president of Concordia Deaconess Conference. She is uh, really, really, really pretty bright, so we're going to ask her hard questions and make her teach us. Um, Sarah, we're going to kind of walk through one of the Bible studies that we actually make available through Higher Things. Uh, you get this, uh, if you come to conference for free, you get a year-long subscription to our Bible studies, but these are also available as archive purchases uh, the, the next year, um, we would encourage you to go to higherthings.org and check it out. But uh, what are we gonna? What Bible study are we gonna do today? Yeah, so there's a new series um, entitled "Misquoted," and so we're gonna look at one of these statements that are kind of out there that maybe sounds like they come from the Bible, but don't actually come from the Bible. I like it. Which one? So today we're going to talk about God not giving you more than you can handle. <laughs> That'd be nice. <laughs> Which is not correct. <laughs> right. So, yeah, um, it's it's one of those sayings we hear all the time, though, right? Like, you know, God gives his His toughest battles to his strongest warriors. God never gives you more than you can handle. Um, and then what do you do with all the places where you feel completely overwhelmed? Is it supposed to be like a divine compliment, like a, 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 a you got this, you're on your own from the the Holy One on high or, or, or what? Right. So, I mean, best construction, it's something that is said to try to be encouraging. Like mm -hmm. you can do this, you got this. But um, when someone is drowning, throwing an anvil doesn't really help with the problem, right? Like that's not really going to benefit. Right. That's a thing that you say when you've got a handle on your situation. Um, that's not a thing that you say when somebody else completely doesn't have a handle on theirs. Um, but it's it's very inward focused though, isn't it? Like if, if, if God doesn't give you more than you can handle and you're going through it, that means, well, where's the, the answer? It's It's within you. Right. So it just leaves you digging for, again, within yourself for some sort of extra oomph or some sort of ability to pull yourself up um, when arguably the Bible promises pretty much the opposite. We are in so much <laughs> that we cannot handle, but that's actually a gift. So it, it, it you, you talked about an anvil and um, maybe sort of inside of our vocabulary, that, that's a law statement, uh, a you do this statement. Um, and it's one that outwardly we can sometimes fake pretty well, which also sounds like a thing we do when our lives are falling apart. But um, inwardly, it doesn't always go so well. Is there actually something that uh, is in the Bible that this is sort of like trying to, to say? Is there a Bible verse that sort of has to do with this that that sort of gets twisted yeah, around? Yeah, so there, there is a section, I think it's in 1 Corinthians, where it talks about getting out of temptation, mm. um, but it's taken out of context, and instead of focusing on Jesus or God's promises, it uh, when it's not fully read or understood in context, it becomes very um, inward driven. And that's where we come into problems. Right. So I think it's 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, we're going to read verses 12 to 14 and just kind of talk through it. It, it. Paul writes, therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Um, and I think those things all sort of have to get wrapped up in, inside of each other because, I mean, even just the very first sentence before, you know, God doesn't give you anything more than you can handle. If you think that you can stand, take heed because it's going it's gonna to tip over, <laughs> right? Yes. yes. Uh, right. So... Again, context matters, reading it within the verses around it. And also, I think digging into what it means that God will give you a way out or an escape. Again, it's not a trick question. It's not like find the right escape and you get out. It's Jesus. It's Jesus having done all of it for you. And he, when you do fall or when you do stand up to a temptation, um, it's still Jesus for you being um, reconciled through his death and resurrection. Absolutely. Um, and that sort of also hits that last verse, flee from idolatry. And an idol is anything that we fear, love, and trust in more than Jesus, like your ability to, well, right. To so do when something. we think about that statement that we're saying, like, 
God's not going to give you any more than you can handle. Well, who's the one doing the work there? You're supposed to handle it. So then who's the God in that scenario? Who's actually like in control? Well, with this statement, it's you. So figure it out. And when you tell that to someone who can't or hasn't figured it out, again, it's back to the drowning anvil sort of scenario. Mm-hmm. Right. And so this this is a, a law and gospel statement, and it finally lets us start to tackle the um, God is not giving you any temptations beyond your ability. Like In a sense, this is true. In Christ, you are actually free to resist temptation, free to live inside of the law, free to to walk inside of the Ten Commandments. That only twists the knife, though, because I'm, I'm completely free to resist temptation, and yet I keep falling into it. So right. um, it, it, it's a question of what you do with, with um, this temptation when you need a way of escape. Is the way of escape the law or is the way of escape, like like you said, the, the gospel? If the way of the escape is is a law, it, it's it's a double down on, on your, your best efforts. It's a try harder, um, find a, 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 a trick, find a, a, a hack, find a way to, to sort of um, organize your life and get away from this thing. And outwardly, again, that can work very well. It's still something to try to do. But there's only one place we're actually supposed to take our temptation. Right. Jesus. Because, yeah, if we are going to constantly be chasing or digging in deeper, I mean, it's the picture of of the simul in baptism. Sinner and saint, every day old Adam has to be drowned, but every day old Adam pops back up. And so we struggle. Christian life is struggling through, but it's not without a solution. The lie, though, is that the solution is within you when it's already been completely killed and made alive in Jesus. Absolutely. And you, you talked about it as a gift. This is actually one of the Bible study questions in, in the study. Why is acknowledging that we are not God a gift? Yeah, well, okay. So one way to look at this is, um, this is, I think, a question you may have put in a little video that we have as part of this study. Um, how are you doing on the Ten Commandments? Right. So like if there's nothing else in your life and you're just looking at the Ten Commandments, how is that working out? Not Mm, not great. Hard pass, right? So if we're going to then instead focus on Jesus as God, how did he do with the Ten Commandments? Perfect. He did better than me. Yeah. I mean, same. (laughs) Yeah. And so then the gift of not being God and not being in control means that we get to look outside of ourselves for the solution. And that then is taken care of. He fulfilled the law. He paid for sin. He defeated all of it. And so we're free in the gospel. And then we can look at situations around us um, with a bit of a deep breath this doesn't define me. Um, I'm forgiven. I get to go back to the cross, hear absolution um, in church, and I get to try again with my neighbors, always over and over again. And and that sounds almost... That, that almost sounds maddening. That almost sounds like defeatism to, to just, well, I'm going to try again tomorrow. But is it is it actually a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it's... It's a gift because we don't have to look at it as though um, we're the guy pushing the rock up the hill and it keeps squishing us. We look at it as we get to work and be in community and have the love and forgiveness from Jesus new every day. And I'm not saying that life isn't hard. Sinful life is hard. The Christian life is a struggle. But it's also not the end either. Hmm. So whatever struggles we have right now don't ultimately define us or don't win. So it helps give a little bit of context. I love it. What's your uh, what's your favorite sort of takeaway from from this Bible study? So okay, I'll say law and gospel. Uh, first, the the sort of law takeaway is how you doing on the Ten Commandments. That kind of helps put things in perspective about whatever it is I think I'm handling. But then just the reassurance or the the gift of the Ten Commandments in that I'm not God. <laughs> and so whatever is in front of me is not for me to have to figure out alone. And so I am forgiven. I am identified as a baptized child of God. And that's good. That's, that's reassuring. That's rest. 
Fantastic. Deaconess Longmire, thank you so much for hanging out with us today in the Drive to School. Hope you come back soon. You're welcome. Absolutely. Bye. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.